Hello and welcome. In this video, we're going to take a look again at surface integrals. Now, in a previous video, we took a look at integrating a scalar function over a surface, and maybe we could interpret that as integrating density over a surface to find the mass of that surface. If it was just a thin piece of metal being bent into that shape, maybe. But this time around, we're going to be taking a look at integrating a vector field. And that's a little bit harder to maybe envision. And why would we want to do that in the first place? Remember that a vector field can be thought of in many different applications. We could think about that as the flow of some sort of fluid. Or we could think about that as being a gravitational field or a velocity field or a magnetic field. And now we're taking a look at that field passing through a surface. Now, in order to start integrating vectors over a surface, we need to have an orientation for that surface. So let's start with that. Let's take a look at the definition of an oriented surface. An oriented surface is really saying that our surface has two sides. So at any point on a surface, there should be two unit normal vectors, and they're going to be pointing in opposite directions. Essentially, in this picture, n1 is simply just the negation of n2, and vice versa. An orientation is when we choose which of those two normal vectors we're going to use. And it needs to be a consistent manner. We can just choose either an upward or downward normal vector for one of these surfaces, and it would be consistent across the entire surface. Now, essentially what we're saying is we need two sides for that to happen. A Mobius strip is an example of a surface with only one side. And you can create this yourself. You would just need to take a strip of some sort of paper or some sort of malleable surface and just give it a half twist and then reconnect both ends to create a loop. And you'll see that if we were to pick this sort of outward normal and travel around the surface, it'll continue to point outside until we get to this half twist and the normal vector will point inside and suddenly we're arriving at the same point on the surface, but we have the opposite normal now. We can't really allow that. So Mobius strips would not be an example of an oriented surface. But for the purposes of setting up these surface intervals, we'll assume that we're working now with surfaces that have a conventional two sides. Now remember, for a parametric surface of the form R of u and v, we already know how to calculate a normal vector. If we were to take the grid lines in the parameter domain of u and v and project those onto the surface, we'll get grid curves on the surface. And it was with those two grid curves that we could find two vectors that lie in the tangent plane at any given point. And that is here, the purple vector, partial r with respect to u, and the red vector, partial r with respect to v. Now, if both of those are vectors that lie in the tangent plane at any point, then the normal vector can be given by the cross product of those two, r u cross r v. But to get a unit normal, we'll need to divide by the length of that vector. To get an opposite oriented normal vector, we'll simply just reverse the cross product, rv cross ru. And that guarantees that we have two normal vectors, one in opposite direction from the other, and they're both unit length. Now, what about the case where we have a function z equals g of xy? In that kind of circumstance, instead of just using that function and having to derive all of this again, why don't we just come up with our own parameterization? x and y could be our parameters. We could just say the parameterization is x equals x, y equals y, and z equals g of x, y. And from that, using the same formula to get the unit normal, we can get an upwards normal and a downwards normal. The upwards normal, you can see here, has the components negative gx, negative gy, and 1, where gx and gy are the partial derivatives of g. You can see it's pointing upwards because it has a positive z component. So we call that the upwards normal. But if you were to take the cross product in the opposite order, then we'll get the components gx, gy, and negative 1 divided by that same length. Because the z component is negative, we'll call that the downward normal. So it depends on which of these normal vectors we are more interested in. When in doubt, we could just go with the upwards normal. But there may be a circumstance where we need the downwards normal. Because actually what we're going to be concerned with most often is if the surface is closed. 
Then we are interested in choosing the outward normal of the surface. And it's quite possible that the surface could consist of multiple sides, such as like a tetrahedron or some sort of cube, perhaps. Then we may want to choose the outward normal on each component of that surface. Or, you know, we may have a paraboloid and a paraboloid we may be interested in the outward normal or the inward normal, that kind of idea. Let's see where this comes in to this new type of integral then. For a flux integral, we're interested in just summing up the orthogonal component of the vector field over a surface. So we really just want the component of f pointing in the same direction as our unit normal vector. So right away, you can see why we need that oriented surface. To help visualize this, here is our surface, S, and we can divide that up into small little sub-patches, and each of those sub-patches could be labeled as delta S i j. And this is very similar to how we took a look at surface integrals of scalar functions. Only this time, we have our normal vector for that patch here, n hat, and we have a vector field passing through that point and that is f. And you can see here the angle between the normal vector and that field as being theta. If we just wish to get the orthogonal component, then we want to take the dot product of f dot n. Because remember that the length of n is simply just going to be equal to 1. That means that f dot n is simply just going to be equal to the magnitude of f times cosine theta. And we will add that up over each of these patches multiplied by the area of each patch. This gives us a formula for the surface integral of f. And you'll notice a little different notation here, f dot ds vector, and that would be because we're looking at an oriented surface now. Simply not just a surface on its own, but an oriented surface where we can always have that unit normal vector consistently chosen over the surface. And that is equal to the limit as m and n go to infinity, just adding more and more patches and subdividing it up smaller and smaller patches, this f dot n times delta sij. Now, you can see how that is very similar to how we defined the surface integral of a scalar function. So if you wanted to turn this into simply just a scalar or non-oriented surface integral. The, this can be written as f dot n ds. And that is going to actually help us to learn how to take this definition and turn it into a computational form. Since we know how to actually compute the normal vector of an oriented surface, and we know how to turn ds into da and make this into a double integral. So for a surface that is parameterized by r of u and v, this n ds that we have at the end here of this surface integral, n is simply the cross product of choice, ru cross rv, or rv cross ru over its length, and ds can be translated into the length of that vector times da. And you'll notice that that allows us to cancel out that length, ru cross rv, and this n ds can be replaced with the cross product of choice, ru cross rv, or rv cross ru da. That allows us to turn this flux integral into a double integral. So our formula for computation, the surface integral of f dot ds, which is an oriented surface, is equal to the double integral of our vector valued function with our parameterization plugged in, dot product with the cross product of our two partial derivatives, r, u, and r, v. And remember, depending on which orientation we want, we may also have to use r, v cross r, u, which is equal to just simply the negation of that vector. It will just depend on the example that we're looking at and why we may want to choose either this inward or outward normal or upward or downward normal. Going back to the case where z is written as a function of x and y, then remember we can use this little cheesy parameterization x equals x, y equals y, and z equals g of x, y. 
And that leaves us with a very similar formula. Instead of having the dot product of our field with RU cross RV, then we are taking our field with Z equals G of XY plugged in and dot product thing that with one of the two options for our normal vector, negative GX, negative GY one or GX, GY and negative one. Now that we've got those couple computational formulas out of the way, let's take a look at a couple examples and you'll get a kind of a good sense as to when we might be more interested in one of the two orientations of those surfaces. Let's start off with a fairly nice looking example here where we start with a cone z equals 5 minus the square root of x squared plus y squared. And let's only include the part of that cone that's above z equals 1. Now we'll start off with a nice function here for our vector field, simply just x comma y comma z. So those are the three components and we're looking to calculate the surface integral of f dot ds. Now, if it helps, you might want to try to graph that cone or try to sketch it. And you'll see, of course, that it has a Z intercept of five. And as X and Y are increasing, that Z is going to be decreasing. That means that the tip of the cone is at the coordinate zero, zero, five. Now, the base of the cone isn't quite at the X, Y plane. The base of the cone is going to be just simply one unit above the X, Y plane. So this is the surface. And the first thing we're going to need is to get that normal vector. Now, remember that we actually only need a normal vector. We don't need the unit normal vector. We just need that negative g partial x, negative g partial y, and one. Now, we can calculate those partial derivatives using the chain rule, and then we can't forget to also negate them. That gives us x over root of x squared plus y squared, y over root of x squared plus y squared, and one for our z component. Now, that allows us to take this surface integral or, or flux integral and turn it into a double integral by using the dot product of f and that vector. And so our flux integral turns into a double integral over some domain d. And here we have f with z replaced with 5 minus the square root of x squared plus y squared. And we will dot product that with our upward normal vector. Remember, this is the upward normal vector because you can see it has a z component that is positive. So at any point on the surface, you can see our normal vector would be pointing slightly upward at the very least. We can go ahead and evaluate that dot product. And after expanding all that out, you see we have a lot of these x squared plus y squared expressions. So it's kind of setting itself up that we might want to integrate this in polar coordinates. And let's see why. If we take a look at that domain D, that is simply the projection of this cone onto the XY plane. And that projection is a circle. We just need to determine what its radius is. So let's look at the intersection of our cone and that plane. Z equals one. And we also have Z equal five minus the square root of X squared plus Y squared. Changing into polar coordinates, that gives us one equals five minus r, and r is equal to four. So the boundaries for that d, that disk, would be r between zero and four, and theta between zero and two pi. And with those boundaries, we can now turn this double integral into an iterated integral. Wherever we have x squared plus y squared, that is equal to r squared. And wherever we have the square root of x squared plus y squared, that's equal to r. And you can see how quickly this whole thing simplifies down. r squared over r minus r all cancel out, and we simply have 5. As long as we still remember our integral element over here, r d r d theta. Now we end up having a much easier integral to work with. Simply just the integral of 5r from r equals 0 to 4 and theta from 0 to 2 pi. We'll start with the power rule. And once we've gone and integrated from r equals zero to four, the rest of this is now just going to be constants and we can finish this right up. And we're left with five times two pi times one half of four squared minus zero squared, which all simplifies down nicely to 80 pi. In this next example, we're gonna change things up a little bit and we're going to have a closed surface. Here, S is going to be the surface of a tetrahedron with four vertices at the origin, 
100, 010, and 001. Now, we're going to make sure that when we are looking at integrating this vector field f equal to z minus x comma x comma y over the surface, we're going to use what is called the positive orientation, which is going to be the normal vectors pointing outward. Now, there's a lot to pack into this little example. Seeing as how this is a tetrahedron, we have four sides. So I've tried to indicate all of those with different colors. Blue side being the one facing the, the viewer here. And then we've got red, which is on the XY plane, purple, which is on the XZ plane, and green, which is on the YZ plane. So this surface isn't smooth everywhere since we have these edges, but it is piecewise smooth which means that we can take a look at the flux integral and split it up into four smaller subsurfaces. As a result, the flux through this tetrahedron is equal to the flux added through each of the four smaller surfaces, which again, I've just color coded, and I've called those four surfaces S1, S2, S3, and S4. Now let's start off with S1. That's a surface that we can most definitely write in the form of z equal to a function of x and y. Our function for s1 is going to be z equal to 1 minus x minus y. In order to change this flux integral into a double integral, then we're also going to have to calculate the vector of negative g partial x comma negative g partial y comma 1. And we're going to be using that in this case because it's pointing upward, which is good. This is the topmost surface and we want an outward pointing vector. So this needs to point upward and it needs to have that positive Z component. Okay. Well, wow. now we've got our field here, Z minus X comma X comma Y. We're going to plug in Z equal to one minus X minus Y into that field and form this dot product to turn this into a double integral. And so what that gives us here is one minus two X minus Y, since that is Z minus X. And we are going to take the dot product of that with one, one, one. And let's see where that takes us. This is just the first of four integrals that we're going to have to evaluate. That makes the integrand fairly simple, simply just one minus X, some common terms cancel out there. But now we have to turn this into an iterated integral. We have to figure out what this region D is. Let's go back to the picture here and project that blue surface onto the XY plane. And of course, that's actually just gonna get us the red triangle. Now that red triangle, it's pretty easy to see the boundary of that. The line on the XY plane going from one zero to zero one is going to be the line Y equal one minus X. So that will allow us to set up the boundaries for that double integral. We will have X going from zero to one and Y going from Y equals zero, which is the equation of the X axis to Y equals one minus X, which is the equation of that diagonal line. And now we are set up to integrate. And try this one out for yourself. I'm just gonna go ahead and jump here to get our answer for this first surface or flux integral. Integrating with respect to y from y equals zero to y equals one minus x. Well, that's gonna get us one minus x squared. And then integrating from x equals zero to x equals one, it's gonna give us one third. And so the flux through that first surface, this triangular region, that is in the first octant, this first integral is going to be equal to one third. Okay, well, let's move on to surface S2 now. That's the red surface here, just at the bottom. That's another triangle. And it actually, it's the same triangle that we were just looking at as the projection of the blue triangle onto the XY plane. Now that can also be written out as a function. Simply just having z equal to zero is the equation of that xy plane. And if that is our function, it's pretty easy to come up with our partial derivatives, gx and gy. But we gotta be a little bit careful here. We need the opposite orientation. Since we want all of our normal vectors to be pointing outwards, we need the downward normal here. Partial g with respect to x, partial g with respect to y, negative one. And if we calculate that, that's simply just the vector zero, zero, negative one. And now we are also going to plug into our vector field z equal to zero to turn this into a double integral. 
So this second flux integral is the double integral of the dot product of negative x, x comma y with 0, 0, negative 1. That does make the integral fairly straightforward. We end up just having the double integral of negative y over that triangular region. And that triangular region, again, is still the same one that we were actually looking at as being the region of integration for S1. And so we will integrate from y equals 0 to 1 minus x and x from 0 to 1. Try this one out for yourself. Again, it's fairly straightforward. Just be careful with the order of integration here. Integrating with respect to y from y equals 0 to y equal 1 minus x will leave us with negative 1 half, 1 minus x squared. And uh, just like the last integral, be careful with a little substitution there. We can just use the substitution for 1 minus x. And we should get negative 1 sixth. Okay, 2 down and 2 to go. Now we have to be fairly careful with these last two surfaces. Since we have the purple and green surfaces left, and both of those are vertical, we cannot represent those as functions of z equal a function of x and y. So rather than doing that, we might be able to just come up with a quick parameterization. For S3, we see that this is simply just the xz plane, and that means that y equals 0. So why don't we use x and z as the parameters, and we just have y equal to 0. Well, that gives us a nice parameterization right there. x comma 0 comma z. That's the parameterization of the xz plane. But we only want the triangle, so just like with our domain of integration, that little red triangle in the last two surfaces, we just need to take a look at the xz plane and come up with the equation of that diagonal line, which would be z equal to 1 minus x. So our parameter domain is going to be from x equal to 0 to x equal to 1, and z going from the line z equals 0, which is the x-axis there, to the line z equal 1 minus x, which is that diagonal line. This time, since we're dealing with a parametric surface, we're going to have to go and use our alternate formula for finding the flux integral. We're going to have to look at r with respect to x and the partial of r with respect to z and look at the cross product. Now, we don't know exactly which order of a cross product we're going to need, so why don't we just start with rx cross rz. That's just the vector 1, 0, 0, cross product with 0, 0, 1, and that gives us 0, negative 1, 0. Let's double check and make sure that's pointing the correct direction. That would be pointing in the direction of the negative y-axis, and looking at our surface, that's good. We really want that normal vector on the purple surface to be pointing in that direction, and so it seems like everything is so far so good. Now, we just have to remember that when we're looking at turning the flux integral into a double integral, we also have to plug in our parametrization. So x is x, y is 0, and z is z. So we're just going to let y equal to 0 in this particular vector field here, f. So that is going to give us our field z minus x comma x comma 0 and we dot product with our vector 0 comma negative 1 comma 0. If we expand that dot product out we just get negative x. We are going to integrate from z equals 0 to z equals 1 minus x and from x equals 0 to x equals 1. From here on out it's very similar to the last couple surfaces. And once again we integrate with respect to z first and x second, and we end up with negative 1 over 6. 3 down and 1 to go. This time around, we're looking at the green surface. Taking a look at the picture, our green surface is in the yz plane. So to come up with a parameterization of the yz plane, we just let x equal to 0, and we have y and z as our parameters. And much like before, we just need to come up with the equation of the diagonal line on the yz plane, which is the line z equal 1 minus y. So from y equals 0 to y equals 1, and from z equals 0 to z equal 1 minus y. Once again, since this is a parametric surface and it's not just a function of the form z equals g of xy, we're going to have to come up with the cross product. This time, the partial derivatives of r with respect to y and z. 
We don't know exactly which order to take the cross product, so why don't we try one out? Let's start off with the cross product of Ry and Rz. That's the cross product of 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. That gets us the vector 1, 0, 0. And that is pointing in the direction of the positive x-axis. But if we look back at the picture, that's not pointing outwards. That's pointing inward. We want our normal vector to be pointing into the negative x direction. So all we need to do is to flip that cross product around. But that's easy to do since that is just going to be the negation of the cross product that we just found. Partial derivative rz cross product with the partial derivative ry is just negative 1, 0, 0. And we're going to have to plug in x equal to 0 in our vector field. As a result, this gives us the vector field here with x equal to 0 as z comma 0 comma y. We dot product with negative 1, 0, 0, and we can expand that. Once we expand that, we'll integrate from z equals 0 to z equals 1 minus y, and then from y equals 0 to y equals 1. And it's very, very similar to all of the surfaces that we've done so far. Again, we're going to have to use some substitutions here when we get to the stage where we've plugged in z equals 1 minus y. That substitution, be careful with a little minus sign, but eventually we should end up with negative 1 over 6. Now that we've got the flux through all four of these surfaces, now we can go back and take a look at the sum of those four flux integrals to get the total flux through the tetrahedron. We're going to have to make sure that we include all of the proper positive and negative signs. And so summing all of these together, we have one third plus negative one sixth through the bottom plus negative one over six through the xz plane and plus another negative six for the yz plane. All added together, that gets us a net flux through the surface of negative one over six. Now, that's a lot of work to get the flux through a tetrahedron. That's four different flux integrals, or if you want to think about it, those are four surface integrals of a vector field. There's probably got to be an easier way. Well, there is, but we're not quite there yet. But just like when we were looking at line integrals that were closed, we came up with an idea called Green's Theorem, which allowed us to take a look at a double integral of the plane surface formed by that closed curve. We'll be able to do something similar, and we'll see that in a future video. So for right now, just be able to make sure you know how to turn a surface integral into a double integral. If you have a surface integral where it is non-oriented and we're just looking at integrating some kind of scalar function, you just have to know exactly how to turn that ds into a dA. And similarly, if we are looking at a surface integral of a vector value function or a flux integral, that ds, the oriented version, we have to know how to turn that into a double integral. And again, that's using some sort of cross product or normal vector. We have to make sure it's pointing the right way though. So oriented surfaces are going to come back and we have to know which direction we need things to point in, but we will be able to shortcut this with a few theorems in the future. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.